That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. No tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Very well learned here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the MOT Introspective. This is the Masters of the Nerdiverse Presents Introspective, where we take a deep dive on one of pop culture's most popular uh, principles, one of the most popular, I would say, properties. And go over everything that particular property is involved with. May it be comics, movies, video games. If it has it on the title, then we're talking about it in a giant macro view. We are Galactus staring over the earth, ready to consume our delicious meal of pop culture. I'm, of course, your host, Mike G. And with me, <laughs> as always, is the most exuberant host... <laughs> Welcome, kiddos. We're gonna have a good time today. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get, you ever see that movie Clown, <laughs> where the guy puts on the clown suit and gets possessed? Oh, that's by the guy who made Spider Man Homecoming. Yeah, that movie's freaking wrecked, dude. I love it. Yeah, movie. I know it slaps. It <laughs> slaps and claps and daps. Oh, oh, snikes, dog! Can you imagine you put on like a Wolverine costume, we just start turning into a gruffy Wolverine, dog? Man, that would make slutty Halloween costumes way more powerful than they already are. Yeah, man, it's like it's like the 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 the, un, the underrated Halloween season of the witch. That movie is underrated. That movie is awesome. That movie is actually quite nice. Same for like, um, God, what is it? Is the season of the witch the same movie where they make the deal with the devil in the very end with the book, or am I thinking of something else entirely? Bro, 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 bro. Season of the witch is where the corporation plans to reinvigorate Sawin. It pretty much murders children all over the world okay. with the okay. crazy I'm masks. Of, I'm thinking of something else. There's some kind of movie where these girls uh, are accused of witchcraft, and at the very end, they make a deal with the goat-headed devil to actually practice witchcraft or something like that. So you're thinking of the Vavitch. The Vitch, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, Dutch, the uh, kind of Eastern European way of going, Vitch, Vitch. Would you like to live deliciously? I'm going to say that. Also, a really good movie. Awesome movie, and I plan and I plan to say that on the next date I'm on. I'm just gonna be like, "Would you like to live delicious?" But Mike, we're getting sidetracked today. We're here to talk about it. It. We are continuing the introspective. This is part two. This is chapter two of our deep dive into Stephen King's classic It. Uh, if you haven't heard the first episode, I definitely would a advise you to, because we talked all about the '90s miniseries, but this time. We're going to be reviewing part one of the 2017 motion picture film directed by and Andy Muschietti, uh, a screenplay by Kerry Fukunaga, uh, Bill Skarsgård, Skarsgård, uh, Finn Wolfhard, you know, the, the remix, dude, this is, this is a remix to the source material, man. I, that's yeah, how I is, see it. There is a lot of really good things going on in this movie in general. This I mean, movie surprised me, man. Oh, hell yeah, it did. When I first saw it in the theaters, I was actually kind of blown back by how well it was done. You know what? I, I know why, because based on our last conversation, this fits more with the book than the miniseries does in a lot of it ways. It does. 100% it does. Especially with its depiction of Pennywise. Um, so, so let's just kind of preface the conversation going forward with that real quick. So this book, sorry, this movie does go align more so with the book in general compared to the miniseries. Mm -hmm. But there are, it, I mean, it does change the plot around. It does change certain events, character motivations. I mean, so on and so forth. That's just right. a given. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we really get a better look of what I think is the really best representation canonically of what Pennywise is yeah. so far in film. It's pretty much, and this is something I've been thinking about all day. Like, I know we had to record today. And the thing that's stuck in my head that I really want to talk about is that in the miniseries, you can rationalize what Pennywise is. It's, in your head, it's still a, a human clown that may be having something else going on. That's the way that I feel that um, Tim Curry played it. He was Magic still Tim Curry. Clown, yeah. But the way Bill Skarsgård plays it is it really <laughs> feels like it's a creature wearing a human suit. 
That's the thing. So throughout most of this movie in parts one and two, honestly, I've been, I've been rewatching part two to kind of get things going along for this kind of review in general. Uh, this Pennywise is more so a creature. It's the entity it's supposed to truly represent in the end that is trying to facsimile a clown without mm-hmm. really understanding why clowns are entertaining in the first place. Mm-hmm. I totally concur with that. Uh, it's it, like I said, it's it's literally the alien and men in black piloting a human and th- and thinking what humans should be like, even though this thing has existed in dairy since what the eighteen hundreds or something like that. I mean, so you know, so kind of. I'm, <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, I mean, in the I says the beginning of time. If we want to really get deep, into yeah, it. that's the better representation from the book. If we're going to be kind of more going yeah. on that line of thought, but yes, man. Uh, Bill Skarsgård, man. It's one of those things where it's like, okay, I have to follow up Tim Curry. What do I do? Same thing Heath Ledger had to do when he had to follow up Jack Nicholson. What do you do, right? You push the envelope. You take it in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. And I think Bill's performance in this film is exemplary just because he's not human, man. Like, even in the initial start of this film, we can kind of break it down from here. I will definitely go through the characters again in their newer iterations, but I want to talk about the beginning of this film where, and I, and I, I played this in my head juxtaposed to the nineties uh, miniseries where um, Tim Curry's Pennywise is personable, right? He's kind of, he's kind of charismatic. He's luring him in. Bill's Pennywise is, is distant. <laughs> it's, it's distant. It's disinjected from the conversation. Yes. And it's in this moments where it just trails off and Georgie, like anybody else would say, yes, yeah, time to go, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's super time to go. This, whatever is going on in here is freaking me out. Yeah. And that's the best thing as, I mean, there's some trivia that's really fun for this movie. Uh, the first time the rest of the kids, the losers club actually ran into Penn and Weiss, it on set was during one of my favorite scenes in the film, which is during the um, the old kind of pre-recorded film scene. And Pennywise <sighs> yeah. leaps out of projector screen. Remember that? Mm-hmm. It was all over the freaking trailers when this came out. I remember that much. Yeah. And that was apparently the first time these kids ran into Bill Skarsgård is just in character without being prefaced what's going to happen. I love – that's one of the things I love about movie magic, quote-unquote, It's the electricity on the set. When a character walks out in costume, right? The because a lot of times this stuff is so hush hush that people don't. These kids they can probably get to see the the breakdown and the blueprints of what they thought they wanted it to look like. It just was one day and they all stopped what they were doing and watched Bill walked out. It was like holy crap, that's terrifying. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it's it, beautiful. I would love to be a fly on that wall. You know? I. One of my favorite like designs of this Pennywise is honestly the huge, huge watermelon head he has. Yeah, the huge watermelon head, the the costuming, the simple white and red, which is the tagline colors for the series. Uh, but it harkens, faded. To a, it harkens to a much older clown. A hundred percent. Where Pennywise looked like he would, he could have been in Barnum and Bailey's that weekend, right? Where he could have been on the Dick Van Dyke show, right? Uh, but Bill's. Pennywise looked like it was out of a photograph, you know, yeah, like a dingy black and white that this thing came to life in, and he completely sells it, man. Like he's it, once again, as it should be, it steals every scene it's in. It's it's just so fantastic, but there's a lot of things that are really fantastic in this film, like the um, the sound design, the music track, the cinematography, just the. The way everything's kind of advanced since the miniseries, like cinematography and, and directional sense has evolved so much. And it's just kind of obvious here in this film as well. You compare the two. Do you, you know that sound of the that's in this movie? Yeah. That is perfect. It is the perfect it sound. It's the wind up, right? It's mm-hmm. it's the perfect tension builder uh, based upon what's happening in the scene and one of my favorite scenes and one of the scenes that is actually wasn't caught until way after the film is when uh, Ben is in the library and he's looking through the old articles mm. and you see the, the librarian in the background stop what she's doing and watch him freak out and it's out of, it's out of focus where you can see this old lady 
turn and just start creepily ear at him. And it's one of the things that you don't catch the first time. And it's like, man, that, that builds so much tension. It truly does. And it's like the best thing to do is just to give subtle little hints here and there. Very tiny stuff that just makes things so much more fun. Absolutely. And, and my, my major question for this movie, and I think I already know the answer, but is this movie for children? Oh, hell no. No, right? No. Is, is this movie for preteens? Is, would you let your tween child so, see this? I would probably put a hard limit probably around 13, 14, because mm. that's like when kids are generally more like, oh, fuck you, dad. I'm going to like go watch an R-rated movie myself. Whoa. You, you, you know, know. Like, like a 13 year old talks. Right. Anywho, I think like a good preteen or teenage movie would be best for this because it kind of fits more so with the protagonists, to be honest. Right. I think at that point, this movie isn't like so gross or gory or too much for any kid that's like in their teenage or blossoming years of adulthood to really watch. I, I And I'm right there with you. It's the Freddy Krueger effect, right? Where mm. Freddy's too scary for kids. 13 down, but 13 up, he says funny jokes and everybody laughs, right? Where he says this... bitch 20 times in the movie. <laughs> bon appetit, bitch. Uh, you know, uh, whereas this film, it dances that line between, yeah, this would terrify a child, but there's certain scenes like the rock fight scene that's so at you know endearing and so fueled by just teen fun. That it's God, like, the it's, rock it, fight is so hilarious, too. I'm sorry to cut, but it's just so kind of funny because they just kind of go, Rah! Primal Rage! And yeah, start- Ben roars at them, dude. I love it. <laughs> ben <laughs> roars at them. It's chucking rocks at each other. I think yeah. it was Richie who raged, actually. But- Richie was the one who was like, Rock fight! And, and, and then yeah, the metal right. starts playing. You know, That's like, right. That was hilarious. I, awesome. I actually laughed when that happened in the movie theater. I thought it was awesome. And I, and I love... One thing I love about this series is I love the moment where the, the Losers Club galvanizes. That's my favorite part of every version of this series from the book to the mini series to this is when the Losers Club galvanizes. That's it's like a Avengers assemble in a weird way. Mm. You know, where it's like, okay, this is the core team. They they fought back the, the bullies and now they're they're united <laughs> in their nerdiness. You know what I mean? So let's let's go over some more specific stuff as well. Like, yeah. what do you think of Henry Bowers in this film? Henry is interesting. Henry, uh, in comparison to the miniseries, because that's the closest mental connection I have, is a bit more goofy villain than he <laughs> was in the fir- in the miniseries. Uh, he's would- not, you know. I would argue the opposite. I think in the original miniseries, Henry's kind of like a believe, like a jokey character. Like <laughs> he's just this bad. You know why? You know what it is? Is that in this film they gave him one humanizing moment, and it's not necessarily a positive humanizing moment. And it's the moment where he his dad confronts him. Yeah, and, and that's stuck in my head. You know what I mean? And shoots and shoots at his feet, which is you know, Jeez. stunning parenting right there. You see, boys. All it takes is a little fear for a paper man to crumble. That's such a good line, but such oh a, my gosh, gosh. rough! It, you get a you get a clean picture of this kid's life in that moment, right? Yeah, no joke. Any like, father, oh, he's also that, like the he's also a cop, so just like hmm, yeah, well. ultra, ultra authority times a thousand, right? <laughs> and ever since then, you knew Henry was down a dark road, man, because you know he he made him look bad in front of his boys, man. Yeah, yeah, and things kind of culminate, don't they? Yes, they do. Kill so, them all. Kill them all. Kill, <laughs> kill them, them all. all. Kill them all. What that I was... like about that scene is that that is playing in the background, and you can barely hear it. They're just talking about, did you know if you go down to the river, we all float? Kids, understand. I'm like, what is <laughs> The yeah, sedation's like... already going before he walks in the room. Yeah, it's just like the very subtle mind pressures of Pennywise that makes it so great in general. Just I... the subtle. Yeah. But uh, what else should we talk about? I mean, the entire Losers Club has changed dramatically as well. Yeah, let's go down the list. Uh, I want to give it up for the actor, Jaden Martell, who played Ben. He, oh my God, that was actually, I think Ben was really well done. Ben was very well done. Ben was very realistic. He was Um, just shy, inner, withdrawn, fat kid, new town, no one likes me. He portrayed that super well. 
I'm sorry. Um, Jeremy Ray Taylor played Ben. I was looking okay, at okay. Uh, Jaden played Bill, but but Ben, Ben is my favorite in this film, and he's my favorite loser. Almost right close to Richie, but we'll talk about Richie. Fair. But Ben, he's just perfect high school shot. The new kid on the block. Speaking of new kids on the block, I love that scene <laughs> <laughs> where I hear is. Stand tough. <laughs> and you're like, yo, she held his whole career in his hands. And she was like, nah, you cool, man. <laughs> that was a really cute scene. I, that's, that's one of my favorite parts of the movie. You can see his face like, come on, man. <laughs> but I will say as well, Ben's like, oh, my God. Like the, the, the way they had the boiler kid with his head missing to scare Ben was his first introduction to the fear setting. That was really cool. I did not see it yeah, coming. It was very Silent Hill. It was very Silent Hill, the way that thing came down the stairs, and it and one thing I I one knock against this movie, it, it has a very uh, repetitive fear trigger, where you hear the, the 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 crescendoing music, silent stops, and then it goes ah, and then whatever is the fear turn just starts chasing you, you know what I mean? True. Every I single w- scare is that. Right, it's a charge. It's a it's a slow walk. You know what I mean. I I hundred percent agree, and I kind of like it that way. It's like it's it's classic at the same time, just different enough to make it kind of enjoyable. Absolutely, and that whole library scene with Ben Whew. is just eerie, man. You know what I mean? Looking through the old papers and remembering a, a better time when you had to go to the library to get information. Children, uh, we had to actually do that no more. Um, and Ben's infatuation with of course um beverly, beverly was a bit more fleshed out in this film but then again in a way their relationship was kind of overclouded by bill's relationship with her e- yeah in a weird way because we all know how you know we all know how that outcome turns out but in that way we can segue to sophia lilla's well, well, actually, I want, I, want to, I want to make this kind of clear. What yeah. do you prefer in the end, the new or the old Ben? I want to do this for every character, by the way, too. Uh, you mean in regards to character progression? Just in, just in general, like how do you feel? Like in general, as a lump sum. New, char- new Ben versus old Ben. I prefer the kids over the adults almost 90% of the time. Well, of course, but like, uh, I'm talking. My, I'm, 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 I know what you're saying. 1980s versus 20 teens. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, um, I prefer this Ben over the older Ben. Okay, because he's I... just a bit more wholesome. He's just a bit more uh, sincere. I can agree. You know, there's a sincerity to this kid. The way he's looking at Beth, I, you know, every young kid has looked at someone like that before. You can just see it in his eyes. Uh, He's, you know, his the acting chops on this kid is amazing. He really sells it, and nothing against the Ben in the '90s miniseries. That's a that kid did a very good job too. You know what I mean at the time. Um, but is it fair to really compare '90s sensibilities against this more modern acting take? You know what I mean. Um, it can be because you know it can be. It just does. I guess it is situational, like you said. It is very situational depending on like the generational difference and the uh, expectations yeah, that are difference between each culture. Yeah. Yeah. Cause effects wise, I'll be honest. There's certain things that this mini series did better than they did with this. True. You True. know, it, it kind of flip flops um, with that. Let's double back to, to Georgie. You want to talk about uh, Georgie? <laughs> Georgie. We oh, all float boy. too. We all float too. I kind of prefer the previous Georgie from the 80s, honestly. You mean the uh, the 80s Georgie to the new Georgie? Yes. Yeah. This Georgie uh, didn't get much time to breathe in this movie. Oh, of course not, no. But Georgie can't. That's the whole point, I guess. He literally has to f- float. The, um, uh, the Georgie scene is a lot more gruesome in this one, though. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a murder mystery. You got Grandana across the street. Barely watching with the cat, I didn't. I thought that all that could have been left out. <laughs> well, it does drive home though from the very beginning that there's something wrong with the adults and dairy. Well, we're gonna talk about the adults and dairy. Damn it, jeez, um, <laughs> mm. uh, Georgie in this movie uh, is very kind of kid actor, and he kind of, and I hate to say it, 
But he, he kind of drags all the other child performances down. I don't, and I don't want to put that because he's the youngest child actor. But it's very, don't you love me anymore kind of acting. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, my I best mean, friend, Bill. It's fair. It's fair. Yeah, maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit. A little bit. Nicholas Pickles <laughs> ing But I don't know, man. I still prefer the miniseries Georgie to this Georgie. Um, speaking of Georgie, let's talk about Bill. Good old Bill. And Bill, he is, I think, much more preferable in the new version because he's just so much more fragile. Yeah. Uh, he didn't feel like a leader in this film like bill in the original in the miniseries felt more like a leader like like Raphael, you know like the leonardo right hey come on guys we gotta galvanize we gotta do it this bill was barely holding it together you know what i mean because he had the most i would say severe child trauma just from the loss of his brother and there's a scene with him and his father which begins the cycle of what's wrong with the parents in Derry, where his son has built this elaborate you know Goldberg machine, <laughs> you know, with all the water and pipes to kind of uh, break down how Georgie could have fell into another pipe or something like that. His dad is like, man, I don't have time for any of this, man. Don't let your mom see it. Take this stuff down. He's ultra dead. Get over it. And it's like, your son is grieving too. You know? It's it's a very hard catch of like, you want your kid to move on for bringing this stuff up in general to you have to understand where they're coming from. So it's like, it's a bit of a complicated situation, I would say. He's not the worst parent in this movie by far. Hmm. Bill's father, not by far. But... Eddie's mom takes that for me. Jesus Christ. Oh, no. Um, in this particular movie, Beverly's dad takes it for me. I mean, he's just an obvious villain. That's just a given. <laughs> and that's that's very fair. That's a given. And I, I... And... <laughs> yeah. But for like standby parents, Eddie's mom is like the weirdest and the worst for me. You know what? You know what the thing about Stanley's mom? It just it hits too close to home because I know mothers like that. Like legit. Not not movie theater, you know, blown out of proportions, but I know moms like that. <laughs> yeah. And you feel bad for your boy, man. You know, you're like, you got to go home, dog. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Sucks, yeah. bro. Yeah. Like, if you want to spend the night, I'll ask my mom, dude. I get it. But Bill's motivation in this movie is the clearest cut. I want to find out what happened to, to Georgie. That's pretty much it. And the moment the cerebral attacks start happening... With him um, starting to kind of get those fear inducers. And then it made me think, like, this is happening to literally every child in Derry. We're just pinpointing on the Losers Club. No wonder they're all so screwy. <laughs> yeah, you got to think about, and macro, right? Like, every single kid from zero to probably 15 is going through this right now. And it's like... Pennywise is insanely OP, dude. He's crazy so, powerful. Like, does Pennywise follow the cultural norms for adulthood? Was he like preying on thirteen year olds only and below whenever he was like his thirteen year olds were adults at some point? Th- or was it eighteen year olds forevermore? Because that's what a true adult age is like. Well, I think what it is is that imagination plus fear equals delicious. And the older you get, in some cases, the your your imagination wings. So I think like he didn't really, he wasn't really going after Bauer in, in, you know, in the hot boys, you know what I'm saying? He was going after the little ones because they had the active imaginations that he could just run rampant in like a reverse Freddy Krueger or the ambulance that's being, that's chasing Pennywise down my street right now. Dead kids are here. Wowzers. There's an ambulance. Uh, so I think Bill in this movie, his stutter was on point. Yes. You know what I mean? That's always a hard thing as an actor to get right. Uh, I, I think that he got it, the, he got it the lightest in a weird way for the, for, based upon humili- uh, uh I would say the uh, hallucinations. But no, Richie got it the lightest. Richie didn't really get any hallucinations in this film. That's very, very true. Uh, Richie, Richie was like, got- Am I the Rich only one not like, seeing this shit? <laughs> he got like a few things, and that's really about it. Yeah, he really got he, he got beep beep, Doug. You know. I mean, they kind of cover more of that in the sequel, but that's not really here nor there right now. I haven't seen that yet. I'm very excited to watch that. I've been watching bits and pieces so far throughout the uh, past few days. I gotta admit, it's not awful. 
Hold like, it. Hold it's not that bad, like so far. So I'm kind of curious what people are saying are saying it's bad about. We will Anywho, see. let's so, talk about Richie. Finn yeah, let's Wolfhard. Go dive into Richie. Seth Green versus Finn Wolfhard, which is interesting. Which is interesting. I kind of like Finn more. I but, uh, Seth brings this classic tropiness to Richie that's actually kind of accurate of how I imagine Richie would be. Not so much like a smart ass cool loser, but more so a geeky, scrawny, kind of a smart mouth guy. Yeah, and the thing is is that I think Finn looks more like Richie in my head, but Seth acts more like Richie in my head. Does that's that make sense? I, that's a good way to go about that actually. Cuz my problem with with Finn is that his jokes are 90 are not 90s jokes. They're modern jokes. Because mm. the audience is not going to laugh at a '90s joke, right? Well, they, uh, yeah, he, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, he, you know what I'm saying? Like his his jokes are very contemporary. Did you know that Derry was a beaver trapping state? Still is, right, boys? You know, like that's some, <laughs> you know, that's that's some, uh, you some know, bullshit. That's some Bill Burr <laughs> shit. You know what I'm saying? That's some Bill Burr shit. You know, so his his sense of humor was intact in his bravery was intact because because richie is one of the more braver of the losers club you know what i mean i kind of miss that they didn't have the movie scene the movie theater scene where he spills the drinks on uh bowers and the boys you know what i mean i wish there was something like that more in this film but richie is also the one that stands up to bill and says you know can we just not do this anymore like people are dead dude do you want to die and it's just like I know that's kind of manufactured movie, you know, and, you know, clashing so they can come back stronger at the end. Uh, but I think Finn Wolfhard did a good job in this role. That's why really, I, pre- I prefer him really over um, Seth, you know? I can't, I mean, he did do a good job, and I really think he portrayed Richie really well. But, yeah, my preference is still Seth. That's just probably I how it's it. going to be. I, I hear it. I understand. And, you're, and you're not wrong, because I think Seth does an amazing job in that role. So, So did you see in the... <laughs> in the uh, Richie beep beep scene, they had a Pennywise clown in one of the background, the, the Tim Curry clown in one of the background shots. Is it true that they had the saw clown hidden there as well? I think they did. I have to go back and check. I, have to go I, back really and check. I didn't have that eagle of an eye, but OG my- Pennywise is back there. Yeah, but yeah, old classic Pennywise is back there, which is kind of a really cool Easter egg for anyone. I would kill for that prop. <laughs> I, that's a. Uh, I, I would kind of get rid of that prop as fucking quick as possible. Yeah, man. I remember I was, I was at uh, Things from Another World in Universal City, California. Shout outs to Universal City, and it's a comic book store on the Universal City Walk. And my dad was like, "It was my birthday." And my dad was like, "Pick anything out the store," and I saw a replica silver plated lament configuration from hellraiser <laughs> and i pointed at it but then i had the mal from firefly moment where i just was like oh no i kind of don't want that in the house <laughs> yeah you like know? yesterday i was looking at my backyard and this neighbor kid really close by starts bouncing up and down their fucking trampoline and guess what this like eight-year-old girl had a freaking chucky doll Mm-mm. from freaking like bride of chucky scene like nope. all fucked up face a knife in hand it's like nope i'm knocking my goddamn door you you, you want to lose that kid <laughs> i'm a good shot <laughs> i'm messing around in, <laughs> i'm messing around in, you know throw a dart at that thing you know like i've practiced my my drop kick for fucking for reason. for a reason only for chucky <laughs> only uh, for chucky <laughs> oh just for chucky man <laughs> Oh man! Speaking okay, of redheads, so, let's talk about Beverly. Beverly, Beverly, Beverly. Your Sophia hair like winter fire. It. <laughs> my her uh, her scene is her her haunting scene is pretty good in this remake. It's very Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, Deep glaciers of blood, my man. You know, uh, g- you know, gazers of infinite plasma. This young lady does a very good job. And she adds another foil to Beverly that is not as fragile as Beverly was in the miniseries. That is, that is pretty interesting because because previously, canonically, I see Beverly more as like a kind of meek, weak, doesn't want anyone to talk to her kind of girl because she's used to just being kind of abused. Abused. Uh-huh. But in this one, it's more like she's kind of a rebel without a cause. Yeah, she's a, you know, she's a firefly. In this I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that. She's a rebel 
and doesn't give a damn about the consequences more so. Yeah, she's more independent in that way, I would say. Which I like. Which I really like, because my problem with Beverly in the old films was that she was too kind of broken, you know mm. what I'm saying? Mm. But, you know, even the scenes, like, like I said, my worst parent in this movie is her father, and those scenes with her and her father is just so disturbing to me, especially the scene where she has to cut her hair, and she's like, you know, I'm going to burn scolding hot water in the place you just touched me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, House on Haunted Hill mode. But uh, she really kind of sells that, you know, summer kids, you know, experience. You know what I mean? She just, she, you know, and that's why I love, like, they actually got kids to be in this movie. And you know it, I mean? there's that, like, that rock diving scene where all the kids are much more interested in Beverly uh, than they yeah. were in the series. <laughs> Well, yeah, and you get that sense. It's, it's, you know what it is? It's the Sandlot mo. It's the Sandlot pool scene. Yes, it you is. It's, it's very much, sand- it's very know? much prepubescent boys kind of realizing, hey, there's a girl who doesn't have as much clothes on as usual in my typical environment. This is really, really cool. What do I do now? <laughs> exactly. Besides, what do I do? I stare. I just, I just stargaze oh, and. Her hair, t- her head turns a millimeter, and they're all like, "Oh, you know." And so, oh, you're not doing anything. Oh, yeah, exactly. But you also, know. Beverly has some interesting moments, like when she's kidnapped by Pennywise. Okay, there's two things to that scene. One, Pennywise the dancing clown scene is hilarious. It's the best it, scene in the movie. It's what? It's the best scene in the movie. Yeah, it's it, it became I a, love it. a little bit. It was hilarious. I it's, love it's so it. dumb. I love it. It's over the exactly. Top. Yeah. And then there's uh, the deadlight scene, which I did not see coming, and I kind of really liked it, actually. The, where Pennywise, uh, his eyes roll in the back of his head, his maw gapes and gapes and gapes open, and then you see the three dead uh, tricolor deadlights spinning around each other. I didn't think they were going to pull that until the second chapter. Agreed. So when that popped, I was like, oh, they're just going there. I'll, you know, let's, let's get into some interstellar horror, man. Let's rock. Yeah, uh, joke. you know, in the scene where Beverly fights her father off and kills him, pretty <sighs> much. Uh, she killed him, right? I don't think she killed him. I think she just hurt him really damn badly. He was video game dead. Like, you fall and then just a powder, uh, you know, a pool of blood just starts to pool. <laughs> like, oh, that guy's gone. I and don't then, you know, then, was, I don't think he was dead. Wasn't it? Didn't Richie run in the house and he was still laying on the ground in that puddle of blood? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I'd have to double check. Um, I've been distracted. That dude looked toasted, man. But even if, you know, well, she did not go to jail. So he must have been okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She just went off to live with family somewhere else. But, um, let's, yeah. Let, let's get on to little tiny baby Eddie. Oh, Eddie. Eddie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll put it back I like, on you. Uh, I kind of li- like how Eddie in this version of the film is more in this version of the story is yeah. more feisty. Yeah. He's like a chihuahua. Yeah. Eddie is very uh feral. <laughs> he's he's straight up like a chihuahua. He's tiny, he's weak, but he's got the biggest bite, biggest yeah. bark, sorry. Yeah, man. And he he not afeard of nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's a he's a, he's a he's a he's a, uh, a he's a you know unorthodox character because he's afraid of everything. He's talking about gray water and all types of crazy you know conspiracy lepers. theories, lepers. But he's also you know has a heart of a lion in a weird way. You know what I mean? It's and I like great. that. It's I like it better great. than the uh, Eddie in the in these miniseries. I I agree, and I also think that like Eddie has some better moments in this film as well. Like yeah. The leper scene is, oh, it's so awful. It's amazing. Man. It's amazing. Oh, man. Oh, that was so good. Him standing yeah. up to his mother. you know, And him I mean? kind of like fighting back around like uh, Henry Bowers and whatnot as well. Absolutely. Him him confronting Pennywise with a broken arm. Whew. Man, he took that, that was... broken arm like a champ, dude. Oh, my God. Yeah, he got he got screwed with that. My man did a no-sell uh, uh, Mick Foley from the top of the hell of the cell <laughs> drop through the floor. I mean, to be fair, my favorite line is still, now I got to kill this fucking clown. I, okay. I was waiting to get there. He's like, man, you put me in danger. You got me down in here. But you know what? Now I guess I got to kill this fucking clown. <laughs> Richie, you're a beast. I love, I love it, man. 
Yeah, it was really great. But anyway, yeah, Eddie, Eddie's great. I loved him. He was such a feisty little chihuahua or like a Pomeranian or some kind of toy dog with a lot of bark. Yeah, man, he's the friend that grabs the brick. You know what I mean? Like if there's a Dotty brick, he yeah. has a friend that comes out of nowhere with a brick. You're like, oh, snap. Here comes Eddie. Oh, Lord, he coming. So then we got to get to the typical character who was probably one of the better ones. And don't let it get to your head. Uh, is Mike. Mike Hanlon. Mike is the best. Uh, Mike, you know, the don't, name don't itself. Wear it, don't wear it out. <laughs> the, the name itself demands attention. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Chosen Jacobs. Uh, what did you think about this, Mike? I like this Mike way more. Mm-hmm. I think th- the thing is, this Mike has more opportunity to show himself given the opportunity compared to the miniseries Mike. And honestly, miniseries yep. Mike is more in line with what I had across the 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 book idea of Mike. Mm-hmm. The book idea of Mike is what I see in the miniseries Mike. Mm-hmm. But this Mike is more interesting because he's bringing a sense of like, I don't know, physical superiority compared to like the the nerdish kind of bookish Mike in the miniseries. He's got yeah. more agency, and I kind of like that, honestly, in this one. I, I like the character growth of this Mike. His opening scene is him having to put the sheep down, uh, mm-hmm. and he hesitates because that's freaking horrifying to have to do it, that at it what? It really shows 13. that this Mike's, this Mike's more mature than the rest of the loser group. He really is in, you know, his uh, his uncle, I'm not sure, his guardian. Uncle, yeah. Yeah, uncle gives him the speech, like, hey, we're, you're either on this side of the wall or you're on the other side. And further in the film, after... Uh, Eddie is carted away by his mom. You see him just doing it. Like he mat- like he just matures over the course of the summer so fast that by the end of it, he's your rock, man. He's the one who defeats Bowers. He knocks him down into the well, Whew, fights man, him straight up. You know what I mean? That fight was rough. <laughs> yeah, Bowers also, had like, it coming, dude. Mike had some interesting scenes of one when he's getting hit by Bowers and the boys. Uh, he looks over in the in the river and sees Pennywise like eating a little arm, going "Hi there." That's that's a meme too. That was a meme too. That was with, him, a, with the arm waving it like "Hi." <laughs> that was such a good ass meme. Also, Mike's um, horror, his terror, is really really gruesome. It's strong. One of my favorite scenes in this movie is when Mike gets his shot at Pennywise at the end, and Pennywise Pennywise's maw opens, and it's just burnt arms grabbing out of his maw. That was yeah. a super cool effect. That was very visually stunning. That was a really good effect. But man, Mike had a – he I mean, God, he had a rough. Which, Mike, you know, kind of – it kind of leads into his character as an adult. Mm-hmm. Like both in the miniseries and the book and soon to be discovered in the part two. He is the uh, – he is the sentinel, right? He's the gatekeeper. Yes. Of Derry. And it's not until the end – very end of the story that he gets to let that go. But he's always the historian. He's always the gatekeeper. Uh, he's really the one that out between Ben and Mike, and they kind of gave they kind of split it a bit more in this movie. In the in the miniseries, it was Mike who was kind of the historian, in a, in a bit of a way. But in this yes. film, Ben and Mike kind of tag team that. They really did kind of like uh, go back and forth here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, ben is more so the historian, and Mike's more so the lore catcher. He's mm-hmm. telling things people say by mouth. Ben's yeah. doing people's written down. Absolutely. And I think it's a good tag team of, like you said, lore versus history. I don't know why. I said lore catcher and I just immediately think of Dreamcatcher? Freaking... Yeah. With the shit weasels? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It just like I it just I don't know. It's took down. It's... Another Stephen King film. <laughs> I forget that's a Stephen King film half the time I watch it all. This is for one person in the audience, and you know who you are. It's for himself. You dud it. That's all I gotta say. Yeah. So um mike is great i love mike and there's more to go about with mike in the uh movie i'll say this much already movie mike and film series mike are very different people already a hundred thousand percent <laughs> like you have not seen chapter two but man they are completely different adults oh man i cannot wait i've heard so much about this movie there's like a there's like a i got like a it movie uh pack off of uh, Sony PlayStation Network. It's probably on Walmart and everything else like that. It's both movies, chapter one and two, right now for twenty bucks. Nice, very so, nice. What very recommend? Nice. And let's talk about the unsung hero. Always the the you know the odd duck out. Let's talk about Stanley. <laughs> Stanley Duck. God, poor fucking Wyatt Olaf. You know his, his terror is the most confusing. Like just 
odd thing. <laughs> Always the bridesmaid and never the bride. <laughs> yeah. Okay, first of all, his terror is dumb because all his terror is is just Mama. You ever seen Mama? No, but it's I know a, what you're talking about. I know it's, it's a movie. It's a horror movie where these two kids are orphaned in the wilderness and they're raised by a, male, um, a malevolent spirit. And the malevolent spirit looks exactly like his tormentor in this movie. What is what does his tormentor represent? Is it just know. represent that painting? Is that it's it? It's the painting. Like it's it's a kid fear, which you know makes sense in context, but man, it's fucking dumb compared to the other kids. And the the, the problem is is that everyone's fear is tied into an emo, into a personality trait. Yeah. You know, um, Richie's fear uh, is legit of clowns. So what does he get? He gets a ton of clowns. Um, Ben's imagination runs away with him in those uh, articles. What's his fear? The kid who, one of the kids who got, you know, exploded it. You know, and of course, uh, Bill's fear is his, is his dead, you know, little brother. What does, uh, what does uh, Stanley get? He gets Mama. You know, yeah, it's just weird. I don't. What's why do they keep doing this to Stan? And the thing is, is that the kid who plays Stanley does a bang up job. He does a really good job. Yeah. I prefer this Stanley much more than the past one. But man, Stanley gets like really good. And also, I love his his uh, diatribe and the synagogue during his mm-hmm. um his uh it's not his bat mitzvah. It's his it's the uh, ceremony where he's officially reading from the Torah. I forgot what it is exactly. Um, I don't want to mess it up. Yeah. Anywho. It's like he gets a really, really good dialogue scene, and he just like walks off after dropping the mic. It's like the I kid, like the Stanley. He's actually one of the better actors of the of the of the Losers Club. This he is. Kid, 100%. He is one hundred percent. It's just a shame that he's Stanley. Because <laughs> <laughs> so Stanley, Stanley doesn't get a lot of meat in the books. Stanley doesn't get a lot of meat in the miniseries, and sadly, Stan, this kid is working with every sentence he gets. <laughs> you know what so, I mean? I also say this. I think Stanley got screwed over in both series, but in a well-done manner, that's true to the book. So it is what it is. You know, you have to be faithful to the source material. Uh, Stanley is not the most interesting character, but he's still an interesting character, uh, you know, compared to other works of fiction. So we salute you, Stanley. And I can't wait to talk about you not being in it chapter two. Yeah. For a brief moment. (laughs) <laughs> For a moment. For the, a the, the kid actor gets more screen time than the adult actor stanley that's amazing <laughs> look in, in <laughs> chapter two so far all i've seen is kid stanley <laughs> yeah man the actor showed up he, he did his scenes he went to uh del taco afterwards okay, so so i hope it's there is a part i just got past before starting this podcast today with you um <laughs> it's in it chapter two it's essentially a build up to a, a reference to one of the scenes in the miniseries. That's one of my favorites. Okay. So you're hyping me up, time. man. Cause we're, I have to watch this at some point between the next couple of weeks. Cause we have something big coming up that I cannot wait for, but exactly. we have, but we have, um, I have to watch this before we next record. So you're really building me up buttercup, man. I, can't, I mean, I can't. watch it tonight. Why not? Watch it tonight. Uh, in retrospect, how do you feel overall about the 2017 iteration of it? This is not a remake, mind you. This is a reiteration of a retelling, a retelling of a um, bestseller. I think it was really very much well done. It was very well done. Like I said, I was surprised by a I lot would, of this movie. I would definitely make people watch this probably before no probably right after the miniseries honestly right after the miniseries about okay here watch this miniseries it was really really good it made a lot of horror movie stereotypes come true and kind of pushed a lot of things for horror movies in general now watch this retelling it's really freaking good for a lot of the same reasons it's really like how do you digest it as as a whole and i'm going to talk about this again in our final closings of the entire uh franchise But kind of like you said, you're absolutely right. What's the watch order? The watch order is watch this film, watch the sequel, chapter two, then watch the miniseries. And then if you're interested, read the book. Mm, I disagree. Disagree? 
I'm how would you, how would you reverse. I'm, 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 I'm saying read the book first because it's mm-hmm. just the better material. Mm-hmm. Then watch the miniseries. Then watch chapter one and two. Okay, fair enough. We're yeah, we're very different on that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think honestly, the book's just like it's just godly. It's amazing. But the, but the book is also like four hundred pages. Uh, on audiobook, it's fifty hours long. Audio, uh, see aud- audible.com. You need oh, to holler at us, man. God, the audible version is so well acted. Holy hell, they got voice actors that give a damn. They're good. You hear that, Audible? Masters of the Nerdiverse, first, 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 first. God, I would just like, <laughs> I would do anything. I would like read and give an excerpt of freaking Twilight if I have to to let Audible give me money. Man, I would read some comedian's autobiography if I was able to get the right. money. The money. Uh, any passing? Any last thoughts on this film? Because um, I don't want to give a, a, a. I want to give a full grade to the franchise. Um, but you know what? We can give a full grade to this film. Um, uh, out of zero to four exploding blood balloons, what would you give it? Chapter one. Four. Like honestly, four out of four. Five out of five. However you want to say it. It's great. Ooh. It's fantastic. I think it's a really a classic movie now to watch. So you pretty much scored this higher than the miniseries. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm with it. You know, miniseries what I, has miniseries has its own special place, but this is this is well done. Exactly, this is very well done, and I'm right there with you. Like I would give it a four point five out of five, only because the jump scare mechanic kind of once I noticed it, I was kind of taken out of the immersion. Oh, that's fair. But other than that, and that's a whole point, that's a whole point off for me, five points off for me, mind you, only because, and the thing is, is that the miniseries didn't have jump scares because the jump scare really didn't exist in a weird way back then, or not the way it exists now, but the the, um, portrayal of the characters, the portrayal of Pennywise, the scenery, Derry as a character into itself, Mm. felt very lived in, it felt very... Haunting, fleshed out. fleshed out. The haunted house is just one of the best set pieces. It really of truly, the last five years. You know, uh, Bly House or Bly Manor or something like that. Bly Manor. We're Wait, not going to talk about Bly? the haunting of Bly Manor. Oh God damn it! I am. Mm-hmm. Son of a bitch! I really am. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, uh, that's embarrassing. I've embarrassed myself. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend this film. It's, I would say, definitely leaps, it's not leaps and bounds better than the miniseries. It stands on its own two feet. And as a isolated in a white room film, this is a very good horror film to watch. Nibolt House, I think. Nibolt? Nibolt? Nibolt. 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 Anyway. Uh, Yeah, would recommend. Go on, watch this movie, enjoy yourselves. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have completed part two of the MLT introspective of Stephen King's It. Our conclusion, our final episode, will uh, we will be reviewing It Chapter 2, uh, featuring the adults, and then we'll be giving our complete synopsis of the entire series and giving the entire franchise a grade from 0 to 5. Um, that's a recommend that you even bother with the mythos of It. And I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation at the end of all things. Uh, I'm very excited to record that episode. I'm very excited for you to listen to this episode because I feel like this is a good one. We got a hot one. Austin, where can we find you? Um, You can find me at Austin Ozzy on Twitter, on Twitch, and all the other fun little things, my little gremlins and witches and druids of Halloween, I guess, because people still believe druids are satanic for some stupid reason. Well, well what's Stonehenge then? Sexy. It is statuesque. Uh, if you like this interesting conversation, you stupid <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> if you like this brand of comedy, you can always visit our website, which is mastersofthenerdiversecast.com. We have over 200 archived episodes with yours truly in Austin and a ton of our friends talking about the nerdiest stuff on the planet. Uh, you can also visit our Patreon, which is for Patreon forward slash M O T N. If you want to support this channel monetarily and give us the monies. Uh, but if you want to support us non monetarily, you can always comment on our post, subscribe to our channels, and leave comments on our content. Because as you know, feedback is important. Are we doing great? Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, just let us know. Bars. 
Um, and if this is your first time listening to the channel, this is your first episode of Masters of the Nerdiverse, I would like to wave at you and say hi through the internet and welcome you to the Nerdiverse. Um, I've, of course, been your host, Mike G. And I have been your also host, Austin. And we will always ask you to open your mind, Quaid. Open your mind. Thank you.